Hello, this is Don Victor, author of Drawn to Win, host of the podcast Drawn to Win, the director of the Academy of Composition, and the creator of the Core 80 Experience, also known as the C and Grow Rich in Art video course, which you can find out more information at core80.com. This is the Drawn to Win podcast, where I have the incredible privilege to draw artists from around the world into fun and meaningful conversations around art and life, and yes, maybe even a little food. You can hear us each week on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. So make sure you subscribe so you always have a seat among friends. Let's get into the show. All right, Lauren. Um... I'm just going to invite the Holy Spirit into this beautiful conversation so that uh, as we talk about creation and being creative in the creative process, I would like to invite the one who created all things. So as we uh-huh. do that, I welcome you into this beautiful conversation about art, life, and maybe even sometimes food. Mm-hmm. So Lauren, where, where are you from? Like, where, where do you exist on this beautiful planet? Well, I am currently in Denver, Colorado, Um, but like so many of us here, I'm a transplant. I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio. Really? Um, Okay. mm -hmm. Yep. Born and raised in Ohio and uh, moved out here um, with my now husband after college. Beautiful. That's cool. Yeah, we've been out here for about five years now. I just did a podcast, uh, I think yesterday with... um, uh, an artist out of Colorado. Oh, really? Yeah. I'll have to send you guys um, each other's uh, information. Yeah. Um, well, that's cool. So how, how long have you been out there now? Five years. Five years. Wow. That's cool. Mm-hmm. I know. It's crazy to think how fast the time has gone. And here's a crazy question. Were you an artist before you went there or after you got there? Uh, definitely before. Um, I've been creating art and considering myself more or less an artist since I was very young. So, you know, three, four years old. Um, awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it helps that, you know, one of my grandparents is a watercolor artist down in Florida. Um, okay. And my family's very musical. And one of my other great grandparents was a painter. He was a sign painter. Mm. Um, yeah. Real old school with like the fire truck style truck with all of his sign painting gear and the whole nine yards and he he was painting probably what during the depression yeah yeah and let me ask you this crazy question was he well off during the depression you know i don't know i'll tell you a story i I was in one of the foster homes i was raised in there was this uh elderly woman there who quote i guess would be my grandmother Mm -hmm. right and her father was it her father i guess yeah it was her father um was it her father or her her husband i can't remember anyways um one of the two um made an extremely good living during the depression as a sign painter Hmm. and i was like how in the world does that happen (laughs) they're like marketing you got people who need to sell stuff and back then you go to the sign painter and they would paint the signs for you right yeah and i was like oh my goodness that's a that's brilliant <laughs> so <laughs> it's like a, a one-man shop uh uh advertising agency right yeah i'll have to ask my grandparents i don't know yeah check that out um so so you have so you're not the black sheep in your family you actually come you kind of have this lineage of creativity flowing through your blood definitely yep that's yep. cool what what does that do to you? Like, what kind does it give you confidence? Or does it make you self conscious? Like, what what does it? Um, I would say it gives me confidence. Yes, and I was actually thinking about this the other day, hmm. um, as I was just kind of mentally preparing for our conversation, um, and I think I end up taking it for granted a lot, hmm. um, simply because it was just so normal. You know, it was everywhere. My my dad is uh, an amazing pianist and musician, and my brother, you know, went to school for jazz performance on trumpet, and he's incredibly talented. My sister's a singer, 
you know, it's just everywhere. Um, and so I don't think it was, I think it was just really normal for me. Um, and my parents were incredibly supportive of me being an artist. Mm-hmm. Um, and they also weren't pushy about it. You know, I grew up drawing, I had a natural talent for it. And so they cultivated that, but they weren't pushing me to do that. Um, mm. You know, they left it open for me to explore what I wanted to do. Um, so I kind of actually forgot that I wanted to be an artist um, until high school. Um, mm. It was just kind of a hobby. And I kind of, I forgot that, <laughs> you know, I, I had this talent and I forgot that people make a living as artists. And then I uh, read this book sophomore year of high school in my English class. Um, it's called My Name is Astro Lev. Wait, I know, I know that book. Yeah. Um, I'm a Jewish kid, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'm yeah. A young Jewish kid who's this like super naturally gifted uh, painter and drawer and, you know, about his life and journey balancing religion and family and art and all of all of that um and I read that book and it just kind of like hit a chord inside Mm. of me and I was like I want to do that that I want I want to do that so um I at that point that's when I got serious about it and started taking art classes in school and at that point decided I was going to go to college for painting specifically um and make that my career path that's beautiful that's awesome Yeah, huh. and I actually just, I re, I just ordered the book off of Amazon, like, last month, because I realized, it's like, you know, I haven't read that book since high school, and mm-hmm. it'd be nice to remember what, <laughs> you know, what inspired me to become an artist. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I think I was my, I think my first year in college, um, I came home, and I think my mom got me that book for Christmas, mm-hmm. and, um, and I was like, what's this? <laughs> I was like, yeah, what do you make me read? It's Christmas. What are you doing? Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and so, um, so I started reading it and yeah, it was, that was cool. So now I want to go back on and um, get the audio book. If there's an audio book version and listen to it, Oh yeah. you know, and three times fast speed. <laughs> <laughs> I finished yeah. it in an hour and a half. Um, oh my gosh, yeah, I'm always amazed at how much faster books go when I do the audio version. <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, I'm actually in honor of you in honor of this conversation. I am going to go consume that audio book. Yes. <laughs> um, so are there any other books that in your journey that kind of became pillars for you? Um, not so much simply because I'm not a very good reader. I'm mm-hmm. really slow. It just takes me a long time to consume it. I feel you. Um, so I'm actually just in the last like year and a half. I'm like really trying. I'm putting forth the effort to read more. <laughs> <laughs> so this past year, I've been reading a lot of like professional development books. I read um, Michelle Obama's Becoming, which was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm reading through. It's like a well, I read through Hawthorne Hawthorne's um, book on painting, um, which was a nice little like. Um, like nuggets of information and knowledge that were easily digested. You know, mm-hmm. I could read a few, a few pages and be like, all right, that's good. I need, I need to sit on this for a little while. Um, Hawthorne on painting, that was a good one. And uh, right now I'm kind of doing the same thing with a book called On Art and Mindfulness. It's by mm. um, Enrique Martinez Celaya. Uh, okay. I think that's how you say his last name. And um, again, it's just like these little um, blips of information, like little quotes by him that have been all gathered by his, some of his students. Mm. Um, so it's a really cool like way to start the day or end the day. Um, See, so yeah, I'm reading through that right now too. Within, with Enrique. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The words of Enrique. Yeah. Uh, right. Hopefully your husband doesn't get jealous. What? Who's quoting this man? Who is he? Yeah, he's dead. Sorry, Dad. Um, <laughs> Actually, I don't think NPK is dead. <laughs> oh, uh, okay, well. He's out there somewhere. <laughs> she's somewhere out there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, just say he's dead. Just cover yourself. I'll just say but, uh, <laughs> sorry, Enrique. <laughs> sorry, Enrique, exactly. Uh, 
Enrique, if you are live and you are listening to this podcast, hit me up so we can interview you. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. Um, when I was living in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. um, the guy that the, I was a graphic designer in this ad agency and um, the head designer uh, lived literally right across the street from me. So I would go into work with him in the morning okay. and it would take us an hour to go through traffic, but we would listen to uh, um, Earl Nightingale. Okay. Hmm. And he would just tell these stories with these profound nuggets of wisdom. Right. And we just loved it so much. And then we, researched him one day after like a year of listening to it mm -hmm. we wanted to go find some more information and we realized oh he was dead for like 30 years or something right <laughs> so it just totally changed the vibe of <laughs> we're like let's listen to the dead guy right because <laughs> we thought he was alive like talking through the radio you know mm -hmm. real nightingale um <laughs> when that happens too and you realize wow like the amount of wisdom that they had then that's so applicable right what's going on now yeah that's um right i just last week two weeks ago i was reading the, the republic by plato hmm. and um yeah actually it's beautiful you can get you can actually do it on youtube they actually have a video and they actually they speak it out and then you can watch the words so you're kind of watch you're listening and reading oh interesting which i suggest it because for some reason it's just so much clearer and understandable that way because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. if you're just reading it at least for me uh, I'm not a great reader so I kind of get lost and I'm like mm -hmm. half asleep half the time and you know <laughs> but in that he's talking about art and uh, he talks about poetry and painting and, and furniture making and really what is what is the artist you know mm -hmm. versus the one who imitates the artist and the one who imitates the artist who imitates the artist right and it's mm -hmm. very very profound and mm -hmm. uh it just the way he articulates it it's like oh my gosh we're struggling with these things today but mm -hmm. they already figured it out like two thousand years ago right like right um but if we don't read them or seek the knowledge then we kind of have to reinvent the will you know right right over so, and over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and they're, they're going to do that w with us. They're going to listen to this podcast and be like, you know, oh my gosh, I got to go meet these artists and realize we've been dead for a thousand years. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, but in a thousand years, it'd be like, they're still talking? I thought they just <laughs> teleported their thoughts. <laughs> but, Didn't they just know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was programmed into their genes before they were born. Mm -hmm. um, so what what is it that you're working on now? So right now, um, I feel like my journey has kind of uh, expanded because I'm, mm. I'm finally working on work that feels um, personal to me. Mm -hmm. uh, like I, I feel like I'm, I'm creating from a place that feels a lot more authentic. We'll put it that way. Nice. Um, so I'm working on a new series. Um, the goal is to create 10 to 15 paintings. Mm -hmm. um, they're all 30 by 40 inches, um, which is pretty big for me, which is why I'm saying that. Um, my studio is not huge, so I've, in the past, I've worked relatively small. Um, so 30 by 40 is a good, good size, and um, I'm enjoying working bigger. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still doing still life, but I'm combining still life and these other spaces because I was getting really bored with like the flat, you know, wall background that I mm -hmm. was painting. And I want, I really wanted to explore more space, but every time I set up a still life, I felt um, like a little bit claustrophobic in what mm -hmm. I was working on. Um, so that inspired me to start working on how can I incorporate more space? How can I get more depth and just have more room to explore what I'm painting. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, I'm creating these still lifes, but they're in the context of um, currently the two that I've got done have landscapes in them. I don't know if they all will or not yet at this point, but um, but yeah, and I, I'm also working on um, 
making the still life, um, elevating it. You know, I have pretty, pretty well settled into working from still life. It's kind of what draws me, it what, it's what inspires me, and it gets me excited to paint for whatever reason. Um, <laughs> I've, I've done some landscape, I've done some figure, and I keep coming back to still life. Um, which, to be honest, is kind of a tough genre, you know, in terms oh, yeah. of marketing it and selling it and getting people excited about it. Um, so my work is trying to elevate it and make it exciting. So I think I think the number one selling genre is still life. I mean, still life is uh, landscapes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah, and so adding those landscapes, like the way you add landscapes in the back of your images, kind of makes me think of. Uh, Dali almost, or, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it takes it into this very surreal, so it's, maybe that's the word, you know, surreal, um, uh, still lifescapes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, we're, like, what are the inspirations of those backgrounds? So that's where it comes, um, that's where I am trying to be a lot more authentic. So all of these still lifes, I like to work from observation. So the actual physical objects in my still life are from observation. And then the landscapes are drawn from my experiences. Mm. Um, so the there's like a painting with um, the arched window that you're looking through the window at this like Italian landscape. Mm -hmm. And that Italian landscape is actually from a Corot painting. Mm, um, I, I was like, that looks so familiar. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So that's like a copy of a master in my painting. Um, but the special thing about that, um, and this is where, um, like I said, it becomes a little more authentic to me and my experiences is I've been to that place. So mm. that's the um, Ponte de Augusto. Uh, it's like an old aqueduct um, mm -hmm. outside of Civita Castellana. Um, which is where I spent five weeks, I think, back in 2013, uh, the summer between my junior and senior year. Um, I went and was part of a master class with the Jerusalem Studio School. Okay. And um, that what is the Jerusalem Studio School? Oh, yeah. Um, so the Jerusalem Studio School is this, I don't know how big it is. I can't, I don't think it's very big, but it's this little organization in Jerusalem that was started by Israel Hirschberg um, okay. and it's just it's you know it's a community um, very intensive school for painters and mm. artists um, and I don't know a lot about the school itself because I did their like satellite program okay. so the school itself is in Jerusalem and then they do this satellite program in Civita Castellana Italy which is like an hour north of Rome mm -hmm. Um, and it's like, it's the birthplace for all these master landscape painters. Um, you'll see paintings from Chivita, from all kinds of artists. Mm -hmm. um, Corot being probably the most prolific. Um, and so I went there and I spent those five weeks, you know, painting and drawing from the same places that Corot painted, which is just crazy. Um, <laughs> You know, like to paint, like I have a painting of this old aqueduct somewhere um, that I did. And so I was just trying to bring in, when I did this painting, uh, it was around the same time that the applications had opened for this summer program again. And so I was thinking about back on all those experiences and the memories and everything that I learned. And um, I would love to go back at some point. Um, and it just hasn't happened yet. So I was kind of drawing from all those memories and realizing, you know, if I keep thinking about all this and I don't do anything with it, I'm going to drive myself crazy. So I tried to, I just incorporated it into my painting and made my painting about That's that. That's awesome. I love yeah. that. Yeah. And then uh, the second painting that I've done so far in this series um, has this, you know, Asian vase with eucalyptus spilling out the top and some string coming down. And then it's got this solid color arch behind it. Um, because another one of the things that I learned a lot about when I was in Italy was, you know, those old um, Byzantine paintings like, you know, Piero della Francesca and Giotto and, you know, all those guys, all those old guys. Um, and I was just kind of 
in in my efforts to elevate still life, I was thinking about these like Madonna, old Madonna and child paintings that have like that really deep gold background mm-hmm. um, that just like really silhouette the figure, and um, it's what makes them so awe inspiring and monumental. Monumental is a good word for it. Um, so I wanted this monumental feeling for this still life, and um, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about being on top of a mountain, you know, I live out in Denver, Colorado, so we go hiking and skiing, and we spend a lot of time outdoors, not as much as we'd like, but, you know, we do what we can, Mm -hmm. and so the background for this one um, is actually a landscape from um, a view that I took a picture of from up in Boulder, Boulder, Colorado, Um, and I, I was thinking about the Royal Arch hike, but then once I painted the picture, I realized it's actually a view from Bear Peak. <laughs> so I titled the painting the Royal Arch after the hike, and then it ended up being a different hike. <laughs> so, you know. And and that one's the, those are on the front of your 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 website, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there they are. That's cool. Yeah, you do have this very um. Italian esque quality to your work, mm-hmm. and um, I don't know what it is exactly. If it's the structure of the piece, or if it may be within the palette that you're using. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think it might be? Um, I think it has more to do with the structure, because especially for these two, I was really looking at. Um, paintings by Piero della Francesca and looking at mm. and he's got so many archways in his paintings um, and so I think that was that had a lot to do with it and I'm trying to study how he organizes space and um, how other artists organize space since that was kind of the driving force behind why I started this series was wanting mm-hmm. to explore space more and trying to figure out how to do that you know, well so I got great artists. news for you <laughs> Great news that's going to turn into a quick commercial. Let's hear it. But um, I created this genius course on art appreciation, which teaches people how to reveal the mysteries behind the classic art, specifically design composition, because that's where most artists have their struggles. Uh And and I kind of was praying about it the other day, and I had this little vision of dying. And mm-hmm. saying, yay, I sold a hundred, a couple hundred, a couple thousand, right? Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. question that I asked myself was, is it better to sell a few of these, you know, and make a couple bucks or to get the message out to a million people? Mm-hmm. And um, and so really the course is about learning how to decode and actually read classic art. Mm-hmm. And so there's 15 things in there that you can apply to a painting and it will just rip the painting apart and you'll mm-hmm. see the mechanics of it, the skeleton, the, the spirit underneath it, the architecture. Mm-hmm. Um, and you'll, you, you can take any master you want that's basically from 100 years before uh, mm-hmm. now because um, they really haven't taught this stuff in the last 100 years. Right. But before then, it was what artists were trained to do was to compose in a, mm-hmm. in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And those artists that you love, you'll feel so connected to them because you'll actually get to a place where it, it feels like you're actually hearing the, 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 the gears of their brain moving. Like mm-hmm. you get that into their minds once you start being able to actually analyze not the painting technique or even the drawing technique, but the actual decisions of their design mm-hmm. and how deliberate it all is. Right. And, and I can tell you have a sensitivity to that because you have so much structure. So the commercial part of this is anybody who's listening to this, if you go to academyofcomposition.com forward slash gift, you'll be able to access that course absolutely free. Go through it and share it. It will change the way that you do art and see art forever. And um, and so that I give that to you too, Miss Lauren. Sweet. I just, I'm pulling it up now. <laughs> yeah. Um, just a uh, note on that. I have to create the, doc, the, the forward slash gift oh, okay. art, which will be active when this, when this podcast airs. 
Got it. So, okay. I will keep uh, that in the queue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if you just go there now, um, if you if you don't get to the gifts, you just go there, you click on the, the little course. Yeah. And um, when it asks you to pay for it, you can just type in Don Victor, no spaces, and it will give it to you for free. Sweet. Okay. So that's I the would other definitely way. do that. Yeah, do that. And um, it, it's it's an incredible um, experience. Yeah. So, uh, so, so you think what's tying you back to the, the, to this old Italian feel is the structure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so go on from there. Um, articulate, like, what, what is it like it, when you were in Italy, mm -hmm. right? Um, what was it like, what impacted you about the art that was there? Well, it's kind of a hard question because I spent so much time while I was there trying to figure out what the instructors were saying. <laughs> mm. Oh, because the language? No, uh, because I was so young at the time mm. and I went in with, I feel like, a lot of arrogance. Mm. Um, so it's an incredibly humbling experience and it just knocked me down and it was the best thing for me. Um, but because it knocked me down, like I said, I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out well, what are these people saying and why are they saying this is so important. Um, so one of the things that still sticks with me is Israel Hirschberg telling me to, you know, look at the geometry, you know, yep. take in the geometry. I was like, what, what geometry are you talking about? Are you talking about composition? <laughs> are you talking about the, the form? Are you talking about the cult? Like, what are you talking about? Um, so I in many ways, I'm still learning from that experience, which is why I think I keep coming back to it. Yeah. Um, you know, that now that I'm older, I'm a little bit more mature, hopefully. My painting <laughs> has grown, you know, I've, my technique has improved again, hopefully. Um, so coming back to those artists that kind of started that journey, Mm -hmm. And kind of like two steps forward, one step back and kind of reevaluating, okay, am I applying what I learned? Am I not? And um, so I think it was, I think it's a lot to do with just trying to figure out what it is about these master works that makes them masters. It um, is the geometry. It's 100%. Yeah. But a lot of people don't know what that means. Right. Right. So I think I'm, I'm still just trying to figure that out for myself. You know, mm. so coming back to those and one, picking works that I like just because in my gut, I like them mm -hmm. um, and not because somebody else told me that they're good and they're masters and mm. therefore you should like them. Um, so I'm trying to rediscover art for myself. And in fact, I <laughs> spent the last few days going through, um, I have a couple big like museum catalogs, uh, mm -hmm. that are, like full of pictures, which is great for me. Um, so I'm going through these and I'm sticky noting all of the paintings that I like just because I like them. Um, nice. I've spent so long, you know, liking things because that's what I think is the right answer. So ah, yeah, gotcha. I'm, I feel like I'm taking a step back and reevaluating and figuring out, you know, what does Lauren like? What's Lauren uh -huh. inspired by? And what does Lauren find interesting about this painting? Um, and how does that play into how I paint? And, and, and in doing that, there's giving yourself the permission to say, I can respect that artist, but I mm -hmm. don't necessarily have to like that artist. Right, right? exactly. You know, and um, I remember my drawing masters talking about Da Vinci. And he's mm -hmm. like, Eh, he didn't really paint that much, and his paintings were really not that great. I was like, what? Who, who are you? Like, you're not supposed to talk about Da Vinci like that. But then when you realize, you're like, you know what? Da Vinci was awesome, but Da Vinci also was a really great con man at, at some level. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, everybody's like, oh, this is so great. It's like, okay, but well, why? You know? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and in there, there's that just a freedom to to be real about it right like to, mm -hmm. to like what you like mm -hmm. and, and to be okay with it and to, and to be okay it. yeah 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 and not to disrespect others right but right. 
but it is disrespectful to say that you like something when you truly don't. Exactly. And, you know, I think I'm just, I'm giving myself the permission lately to figure out what it is that I like about these artists. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that I like about those old Italian pieces, um, with like the Piero and Francesca pieces, specifically, I liked, I like the simplicity of it. Mm. I mean, they're very complex, but yet there's, they are so simple. Um, and they are straight up and um, I do, I, I do like that, you know, structure, the symmetry across some of them and that architectural structure that is combined with the foreground and the background. Like, mm-hmm. I like that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that's why I brought it into these two pieces and, um, going back to like the Madonna and child pieces with the gold backgrounds, those really, um, mm-hmm. more Byzantine style, or not Byzantine, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, the monumental piece of those, I think, is just so interesting and beautiful. Um, and again, like, the color palettes are very simple and striking. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that's where I was going with this one, was trying to capture some of that. I have to say, you know, at, at first, when I first saw your work, um, I wasn't really sure how to take it. Right. I knew it was good. I was like, eh, but yeah. I don't, I'm not getting it. You know, and maybe it was because it's still life subject right. matter. But now I'm sitting in front of it. I'm kind of getting your vibe and I'm kind of feeling your vibe in these pieces. And I'm just, and my eye keeps coming back to the Byzantine one, right? That, that uh-huh. gold color behind that, that vase. And I'm just loving these very almost flat looking leaves but just kind of how they bend forward and back and overlap each other just a little bit it's not dramatic Mm -hmm. but it's just this little subtle like there's this beautiful richness of space between it but it's also very close Mm -hmm. and um and i just enjoy the way it moves my eye It, it 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 triggers my eye in such a way that that i feel this this delightfulness in it and I'm like, man, that's that's a painting I could have on my wall and just like <laughs> enjoy, you know, just it just stimulates like a calm breeze almost. Very but oh, like a very you. gentle breeze. That's yeah. um awesome that you say all that. That that's very affirming. <laughs> um, so thank you. And that actually hits on a, another piece that plays into um me figuring out why I'm creating these pieces and um that bit is going after a feeling of balance Mm. and um, peacefulness, you know? Mm. When I'm studying a still life, like, uh, and actually when I'm painting in general, um, I don't typically listen to anything, Mm -hmm. uh, no music, no, you know, sometimes I'll listen to a podcast, but I have no problem just being in complete silence and working and just, you know, it's very meditative to Mm -hmm. me. And so finding ways to bring that meditative, um aspect and moment into my work Mm -hmm. Um, because that's that's what I love about painting is just feeling in the moment with what I'm looking at and what I'm working through um and so bringing some of that to my work especially now I mean the world is so polarized and it can be so overwhelming (laughs) um so finding a moment of peace to give viewers um I know I mentioned before my work, I was kind of getting tired of the flat background and just in general, I was feeling like my work was falling flat. Um, Mm -hmm. And I was having trouble figuring out why I was painting in the first place. You know, like if I'm painting still life and it's, yeah, yeah, you know, cool. I painted this thing and it looks good and I had fun doing it. But at the end of the day, who cares? You know? Yeah. So I was really struggling with that. And so this is, this is kind of my jump into figuring out how to problem solve around that, you know, bringing in things that feel more meaningful to me and hopefully have a more meaningful impact on the viewer so that they're having a meaningful experience. Well, I'm going to encourage you in it because it, don't take it personally, I know artists are sensitive. (laughs) Um, But these two paintings versus let's say your last 10 or 15 paintings oh yeah night and day 
Oh, yeah. Right. It, I mean, you tapped into something that's that's honoring you and your perseverance. Right. The other ones, it was like you were trying to do something with the still life, and you're like, let me put something on it. Let me put something mm -hmm. on it. And then these, you kind of took that crap off of it mm -hmm. and just said, okay, let me not put anything on it. Let me maybe like see what it can be in. Let right. me put it in in something versus something on it, right? Mm -hmm. And and it just it, it, these things came alive. Yeah. And um, and I commend you on that. That's, Thank that's, you. Thank you. Yeah. No, I don't take that personally at all. I I feel the same thing. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And you know they always say like. Uh, uh, painting when you're when you're making art you're always producing a self-portrait mm -hmm. and I'm kind of curious psychologically emotionally spiritually what inside of you was what did you take off mm -hmm. and then what atmosphere or environment did it release in you so um kind of going backwards a little bit here um so last year um, last January, January 2019, was my first, the start of my first year being a full-time painter. Um, before mm. that, I had always, like, worked part-time, worked you know, full-time, part-time, you know, back and forth all over the place. In January 2019, I took that leap to be a full-time painter. Um, and it, part of that, I started working with a mentor. Um, mm -hmm. Her name's Marianne Mitchell. And she does, I think she does, similar to what you do, she does a lot of coaching with artists mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and helping them figure out their why, you know, figure mm -hmm. out why they're doing what they're doing, what inspires them, um, helping them own that and how to bring that to their work and, you know, lining up your heart, your mind and your hand, making them all, you know, work yeah. together to create something that is whole. Um, so I started working with her and working through and actually diligently, you know, intensively and um, intentionally is the word I'm trying to think of. Intentionally mm -hmm. working through those questions of why am I doing this? You know, why, why am I painting? Why am I a painter? And realizing that, you know, maybe painting just for the sake of painting something isn't enough for me. And that's okay. Because I feel like up until this point, I had kind of bought into the idea of removing myself from the subject, removing mm. myself from the painting and letting the painting exist as its own thing. Like I was kind of just the, um, the vehicle for the painting to exist. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, it's not enough for me. So I've started you know, like I said before, trying to figure out ways to bring more of myself into the painting and being okay with it. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big step for me because, you know, for so long, um, I've worked hard to, you know, get the right answers and have the right answers, but are they my answers? So I'm working through a lot of that and I think I've, I've made that switch to, instead of just figuring out how to make what I'm looking at just exciting enough for me to want to paint it, mm -hmm. um, I'm figuring out how can I compose something that is whole and feels authentic to who I am mm -hmm. and what I want to say. Because what I have to say could be important to somebody out there. And if it's not, that's fine, but it's important to me, so I shouldn't say it. <laughs> and yes you should right <laughs> uh, yeah. creating these pieces has been it's been empowering and I'm super excited to keep working through the next you know 12 10 12 15 however many I go with yeah I'll tell you I, I, I realize you're spot on what you said earlier about the spacing I'm looking mm -hmm. through all your images and outside of maybe one or two or three, well, I'm going to actually pull that back. I, you actually have no painting that, that gives enough space around the edges, except for the right. last two, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. there, and there really is a quiet stillness 
to the to these last two, and your other ones seem very busy, right, um, and compressed, and mm -hmm. it doesn't feel free. They also don't feel alive like right. these two last two. So this jump in your work, oh my god! And, and you're saying these two last paintings came after you're working with your mentor. Mm -hmm. All yep. right, so here's an ad for anybody. If you really <laughs> want to get serious about your artwork, go find yourself a mentor. Yeah, yeah. It makes a world of difference because, I mean, as artists, we all know it's it's hard to be in your studio alone all day. I mean, I know yeah. it's really good for some people, but um, it can also be really hard. You know, nobody bounce your ideas off of or yeah. work and, through those questions with. And the people who who you do go to, a husband, a parent, a brother, a friend, mm -hmm. Facebook, they're all right. going to say the same thing. Exactly. Oh, you're so good. You're so talented. Mm -hmm. Good job, little artist. Tap, tap, tap on the head. Um, yeah. Or Facebook is like, wow, beautiful, great. And you're like, I ain't growing <laughs> from that. Thank you, but that's not what I need right now. Either buy it or tell me why you're not. <laughs> no. <Right. laughs> like, what's wrong with this thing, you know? Um, and so that's what I'll do a lot of times. I'll, I'll, I'll find an artist and I'll give them like a true, uh, honest feedback on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's in between the two. Mm -hmm. And the gratitude that they come back at me with, it shocks the other people. They're like, oh my God, how can you say that? But the <laughs> artist gets it, right? Yeah. And they're just like, oh my God, this is like water to my soul. Thank you, you know? <laughs> so if you can work with a mentor, someone who's going to be honest, give you real relevant raw feedback so that you can mm -hmm. actually grow and they're not being cruel, but they are being direct and right. honest with you, yeah. uh, take it. And obviously you have somebody because it shows in the work it's it's mm -hmm. it's incredible the difference definitely yeah and, and, your, I, and your other stuff wasn't bad it just, right. just just this is just so much more sophisticated and elevated and intelligent mm -hmm. and, and it's it's shows that you're far more in in tune with who you are right and there's a uniqueness to it too you know mm -hmm. i haven't seen this anywhere before that's awesome <laughs> yeah this is cool so very cool <clears throat> um yeah like I didn't go get my master's degree, and I know that the mas a master's degree for artists, you know, fills a lot of that. Like, it's a lot of really intensive um, feedback and critique and time to paint, and, you know, I didn't end up doing that. So I'm kind of getting it in bits and pieces. So this last year has been really, really great as, like, yeah. a, you know, master's alternative. <laughs> sure. And you have to be careful because a lot of times people go and they pay all that money to go to school expecting mm -hmm. those things. But most of the time, you don't get what you're expecting, and mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's it's strange when you pay a a, a coach or a mentor um, to come alongside of you because you also hold them accountable, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 it's a very because it's so personal, it's one on one in that sense. Um, you get so much more service out of it. Yeah, so, definitely. So I think uh, your investment of time and uh, resources is, is wiser in what you're doing than going to get a degree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Um, uh, nah, don't worry about it. If it comes back, it'll come back. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. I was going to say um, something you might want to uh, think about or consider. Mm-hmm. And so when I help an artist design a collection of five or 10 or 15 pieces, um, before they actually paint it, mm -hmm. I actually have them compose it all out first, the entire, the entire um, show. Oh, interesting. And the reason why is this. By the time you paint your 10th or 15th painting, it's mm -hmm. going to be so different yeah first one yeah and though your growing is good the problem is is now you have this collection that doesn't look that doesn't feel unified right there's a little bit of disjointedness there yeah and if you 
build it all together and out the experiences I've had with it and, and the students that I've done this with, people will either, I've had uh, an experience it more than once where someone bought the entire show because they don't want to oh, break wow. up the family, right? Yeah. Um, I remember I was helping an artist and <laughs> this is funny, I went up to, he was in Jersey and, and he did this show in New York and it was his first show and he was about like maybe about 70 at the time mm -hmm. and um and this lawyer lady walked in and she's like oh my gosh the unity and the composition right <laughs> and it wasn't an individual painting it was the whole that sh that that impressed her as soon as she walked in and when i heard that i literally ran up and kissed her i probably <laughs> got sued for it but i'm like oh my god God, like that's like the best compliment ever, right? Yeah, and, amazing. And uh, and then he went into negotiations. Uh, the person didn't buy it in the end, but they did go into negotiations about buying the entire collection. Wow, um, and, that's that's really great that you say that because um, I that is something that I'm worried about. You know, even with my, I'm working on the third piece right now, and it's almost done, and it's mm -hmm. already pretty different from the first two I did. <laughs> Yeah. And and that's the thing. It's like each one has their own story, but when you yeah. work together, then there's this master composition over the whole, right? Yeah. And yeah. then there's you like can, a common thread running through it. Yeah. And then you designing them and you're making similar choices or, or at least you're being deliberate why this one is this way and this other one is that way. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then, and then what's beautiful is once you have them all composed out properly and you transfer them to your canvas, then all the heavy thinking is done, mm -hmm. right? Then yeah. you can just like zen out into the painting process. So like the one artist, Bill, he did 13 paintings, right? We spent three months on composing everything out mm -hmm. and it took him less than two weeks to paint out 13 paintings. Oh my complete. God. And he was like, this was like the simplest thing ever. He was like, da, 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 you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and they came out beautiful, but he was able to zip through them because everything was already done you know mm -hmm. um yeah so. and i know a lot of artists don't work that way but i i do i like i work through a lot of my idea before i even put my brush on the canvas um, oh i can tell I have, yeah like i have to have a game plan before yeah. i before i even start um and when you go through that little course i sent you to Mm -hmm. you're going to see how these people strategize and, and, and the way that they go through it, it's almost like watching a football game where they're like, okay, we're going to turn here. We're going to go here, da, 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 you know, um, mm -hmm. and, and the level of control and all these different uh, layers, you know, from how you control your values to how you control uh, how the eye moves, where it goes, how far it goes, the repetition of these spaces. I mean, just, just every, it's insane. And, yeah everything they submit everything every element of of design they submit to the principles and the principles submit to their vision mm -hmm. and um and just having total control to, over it all it's it's why they're masters it's it's incredible yeah. and, and yeah. you're and you're moving down that path so you know yeah. i'm excited oh, i'm so excited to do that course yeah i want to yeah do it and then let me know how it goes because it's um I, someone like you you're gonna be a sponge you're gonna take it and it's just it's, it's gonna skyrocket the stuff that you're doing awesome. um so like when you so i was gonna ask like where do you see yourself going from here that's a weird question to ask now but um <laughs> but like what is your vision like or what what is it that you're think you're go where you're what blah, 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 blah. hold on or where, or what is it that you think you're going towards? Do you mean um, as a professional or as like in my painting itself? I kind of don't care about the professional part of it um, mm -hmm. because that's just a, a, a reward for you tapping yeah. deeper into yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm kind of more concerned about you. Mm -hmm. uh, like, where do you see, who do you see coming out of this? You know, I don't know yet. Um, I've done two and a half paintings in this series. So I think, you know, for right now, I can see to the end of 10 to 15. And beyond that, I have no idea. Yeah, because, yeah, I got you. Um, but I'm super excited to just keep um, 
living into myself and letting that kind of drive me mm-hmm. and letting that um, learning to accept my decisions and my influences um, and not shying away from it because for so long, you know, if I had an opinion about something, I would shy away from it because, you know, heaven forbid it, it be the wrong opinion. Um, and when it comes to art, that's such a silly approach because, you know, it's all, it's all so, you know, pretty subjective and, um, I can like what I like. So I'm, I'm giving myself the permission to explore that and to figure out who I am as an artist um, and as a visual thinker. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'm excited to see kind of how I come out the other side of that. Cause I feel like I'm at the beginning of this journey. Indeed. 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 But the the stuff that you're producing at this, like that leap that you already made, Mm -hmm. my God, I'm excited to see like where you go in the next year. I'm yeah, not even talking too. five or 10 years, just, just within this year, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, Cause you have the skill and you have the sensitivity. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you're focusing more uh, on being authentic, you use that word about 490 times in the beginning. I know. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> no, no, don't own it. Own it. Um, uh, I would have you do go challenge yourself on what does that mean to right. be authentic? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh but yeah. And so for you, like being authentic at this point is making sure like that you're not copying somebody else's stuff. So the still life is yours. The scenes in there are things that you've experienced or been to that you've had a uh, tangible experience with. Mm-hmm. Am I correct in saying that? Uh, I wouldn't say worrying about copying what somebody else has done. Cause I don't feel like I've done that ever. Uh, well, what I meant was like, y- y- you're not using photos of places you haven't been to right 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 right. yeah that's what i meant by copying some like someone's photo or something like that that's what yeah no i'm using strictly my own my own experiences my own references um and then in terms of the still lives themselves it's you know whatever catches my eye colors that like oh wow like those colors together are really beautiful i should do something with that or you know, I have a hard time leaving a still life as just a still life, so I'll probably still be bringing in random bits of paper or yarn or something <laughs> to make it a little bit weird, you know, because it can That's help. That's cool. But, um, yeah, I like to have a little bit of fun with that. The the uh, Byzantine one, mm-hmm. um, I'll tell you, it's, it's strange. I think my favorite moment in the painting, and it's not – it doesn't mean that it's like the the best rendered out or skillful part. It's just this little tiny tiny moment that I just ah every time my eye lands on it, I'm like ee, right? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I want to put like a a little dress on and go sell uh, Girl Scout cookies or something. But um, <laughs> it's right at the bottom of the vase. The uh-huh. fabric on the right hand side it just has this tiny little fold, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And the repetition of the curve of the vase at the bottom, the repetition of the core of that shadow and that highlight has that same repetitious curve. And mm-hmm. then even a slight curve all the way in the bending up of the fabric at the end. So mm-hmm. it's like this ripple effect, like woo, 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 woo. And, it, yeah. it, and then with the force of the shadow coming from the left towards the right um, and those angles, it just, for me, I just feel like it, it was either just placed there and somebody ran out of the picture right mm-hmm. it, like like it happened so quick like the movement it still slightly has a little wiggle to it like a little a little movement right yeah yeah and, no, i love that little the little flip of the fabric that's one of my favorite parts of yeah that. yeah just that little area there it's it's um it's just delightful <laughs> thank you <laughs> that's nice um so like if you we're in your studio mm-hmm. and let's say a 10 year old version of yourself walked in, let's say 12. Um, and she sat down and you looked at each other and you realized, Oh my gosh, we're, we're the same person. Um, and she looked up to you and said, Lauren, what, what would you tell me to do to become like you? Hmm. What would you tell her? 
tell her to not be afraid of who she is. You know, don't, don't stifle that voice just to find the right answers, just to get the grade, just to, you know, come out on top on paper, you know, don't be afraid to take those risks, you know, be more of a risk taker. And, and because you knew her, because mm -hmm. you were her, would there be a specific example around that age that you would tell her, hey, this, this situation is going to come up, you're going to play it safe, but why don't you go ahead and not play it safe and go a different route? Um, I don't think so. More just like across the board. Like, um, now I'm going to push you. I'm going to push you on it because see, being across the board is that that's a generic comment, right? So, is, yeah. so I want to push you because I'm actually giving you a tool to go deeper mm -hmm. in yourself. Okay. All right, you're so gonna have to find, get to think about yeah, that, it. That's cool. That's cool. And maybe it's not. Maybe it's not twelve. Maybe it's sixteen. Maybe it's fifteen. Whatever. But around that that age. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Hmm. Probably just like in college. I mean, I okay. Spend so much time not um you know kind of on the edge of exploring but not mm. quite throwing my whole self into it mm. um so i would you know i would try to be a little bit abstract just for the sake of it but mm -hmm. i would throw my whole self into it and let myself go if that makes sense into into being like a, uh, doing an abstract painting doing abstract painting or exploring brush mark or um, being more in tune with what I wanted to do with mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, I was more focused on, well, what's the right way to do it? Mm. You know, what's the right thing to paint to make it more important? And I mean, I, I got away from that a little bit senior year when I started painting the trash sculptures. Um, as my dad so affectionately calls it, my trash paintings. Um, <laughs> this is trash. Well, thank right. you, Dad. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're right. It came out of my recycling bin. Um, so I, I feel like I pushed myself to be a little bit more adventurous with those. Mm -hmm. um, but then I kind of got lost in the, oh, you know, I did this and everybody liked it. So I'm just going to keep doing it rather than really understanding why I liked doing it in the first place. Mm. You know, does that make sense? Oh, totally. Totally. Yeah. Totally. It's, uh, that's, you know, it, it's, it, that's an issue that a lot of people suffer from. Mm-hmm. That and then I would also say, um, I know earlier I said I was pretty arrogant going into that Italy experience. Mm -hmm. Um, because up until that point, I you know, I had gotten good grades, I was at the top of my class, I had scholarships, so I felt like, um, there wasn't anywhere else for me to go. I mean, I went to a liberal arts school, so it wasn't all that competitive. Um, mm. so I was at the top of the top, and everybody was just like you said, like giving me the pat on the back um and I <clears throat> I didn't push myself like I I let that kind of be the final word mm. so if I were talking to myself at 12 years old 15 whatever going into that I would say you know don't let the pat on the back be that final word keep pushing yourself like don't don't settle for you know whatever's happening yeah, don't settle for other people's approval of it. Exactly. Yeah. So let me then so then here's a question. What is the conversation that you have to have with inside yourself that you hear yourself saying to yourself, This satisfies me. This is good. Um when it when I feel connected to it. Mm. Um, which is why I really am, I'm really enjoying bringing 
pieces of my past experiences mm -hmm. and, you know, experiences of where I am currently, where I've been, maybe where I want to go. Um, bringing, bringing that into my work and looking at it and, and having those memories come back and feeling like, oh yeah, you know, I was there and that happened. And, but also simultaneously being able to feel like I'm breathing that peaceful moment. You know, if it's, if it's bringing me that peaceful moment, I know I've got there. Beautiful. Because I'll say those, those are the, the three words that I feel the most with these new paintings versus the old one. There's space, there's breath, mm -hmm. and there's peace, right? Yeah. And so you've given yourself space in a weird way, literally space, mm -hmm. but also compositionally, you've given yourself space. And that's mm -hmm. the reason why we're feeling, we don't feel what we look at. We feel, um, it's really the invisible part of it. Like uh, we actually feel the math that's in the artwork more than what we actually see. Mm -hmm. So it's what we don't see is, is, is what we feel. Um, <clears throat> so your spacing because of the way you compose it differently, it, it, it allows the eye to breathe, right? Mm -hmm. And then in doing it, the way you're painting it and all the other things that you're doing, there is a sense of calm, a sense of peace, a sense of, um, uh, I don't want to say oneness, but like, um, and this is a, the wrong word, but rightness, like it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's right. Um, but not in a like correct or incorrect way. It just means like alignment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like I could sit in front of it and meditate for a while. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. So what I would encourage you to do is think about like your landscapes mm -hmm. and making them raising your game with your authenticity. So not yeah. just saying, Oh, I was there, but then also ask, like really going deeper and saying, what did that place make me feel? Right. I'm writing, I'm writing this down. <laughs> and if it made you feel, and, and Norman Rockwell said this, he said the success, the, one of the, the keys to his success was that he was able to make you feel two different emotions in the same painting. Mm -hmm. So when you feel two different emotions, what actually happens is there's a, tr uh, a transitioning, right? So let's say in one moment, you might feel the anxiety of, of loss, right? But then you feel the joy of finding something. Mm -hmm. And it's moving the consciousness of the viewer from one state into that other state that all of a sudden you unlock this experience in them, mm -hmm. right? And they're like, oh my gosh, I feel it. I, I, it's, a, it's alive. You're also moving them through time because now it's just not this one moment of frozen time, but mm -hmm. you actually create this experience. So, um, so find a place and then spend time um, really going inside yourself and, and trying to get clear and articulate the feeling mm -hmm. and, and that feeling will have a vibration to it or, or a frequency to it. Yeah. And then, then you want to try to figure out artistically how to design it so that when you look at it, you, it triggers back that same feeling. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, and that kind of goes back to my wanting to play with balance in mm -hmm. my work too. You know, if I'm balancing these two emotional experiences, that fits right into what I'm trying to convey. Yeah, and you have these two elements, like you have this foreground element, the still mm -hmm. life, which can convey one feeling, and then you have this background element that can convey another feeling, right? Yeah, I never thought about it that way before. And and now, you know, I'll, I'll think about it this way, the, the still life is you, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the background is the experience that you're in. Yeah. Right? And, mm -hmm. and what's the relationship between those two? Um, yeah, this is cool. This is very cool. I'm, oh, man, I'm excited for you, girl. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would, you know, it, it's weird. It's like still lives are a tricky thing because it's like 95% of the time they're boring as heck. Right. But if you find someone who's actually using it to communicate, mm-hmm 
then I think still lives become one of the most exciting things ever. Yeah. You know, because you have total control over it for the most part, right? Well, as I say, 95% control over it, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and it's not, it's not a figure that you're drawing that, you know, oh, they're getting tired. They have to go eat now. And tomorrow you're, you know, (laughs) whatever, right? (laughs) You you have so much control over it. Um, But the, but if you can really figure out how to infuse your soul into it, your story, mm-hmm. your yeah. frequency into it, it becomes an incredible, yeah. incredible thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It becomes so much more powerful. Yeah. Outside of still lives, is there anything else that you like to paint? Um, well, um, more or less completely unrelated. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, happy to share. I do a thing called paintings for patients. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, one of my things, cause I, when I started working full time as a painter, working fully from home, I didn't realize how much social interaction I got from working. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't realize how much I enjoyed working. <laughs> um, so I started volunteering at the hospital. Um, that's just 10, 15 minutes away from my house. Um, and in doing that, I learned that there are quite a few places in hospitals that are not allowed to receive live plants and flowers. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was like my first day on the job, if you will. Um, and I learned about this and I thought to myself, like, you know, I could, I could fix that. I could, uh, that's a problem <laughs> that I could solve. <laughs> um, so I've started doing small eight by 10 watercolor paintings of flowers um, that I then package up and bring to patients who can't have live plants in their rooms. Um, so right now I'm primarily bringing paintings to the transplant floor, Mm -hmm. um, but I would like to also, you know, serve different ICUs or, you know, oncology, cancer patients. Um, so yeah, I try to do one painting a week. Sometimes it ends up being more like once every couple weeks, but Mm -hmm. yeah, it's really good for me because it's, um, a little bit mindless, and it's good for my drawing practice. I'm using watercolor, which I'm not super um, comfortable in, so it kind of gets wow. me out of my comfort zone, challenges me to think differently, because it's such a different process than oil. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it just, it's a good challenge. It's a good break from my usual work, um, and I just love knowing that so- it's bringing somebody joy um, is really exciting to me. Yeah. When I saw that, I just thought, Oh my God, that's like the most ingenious thing ever. Yeah. And I was actually afraid to talk about it. Cause you know, out of a thousand people, two of them are going to run off and steal it. I but... know. Right? I tried to trademark <laughs> it, but apparently that was the wrong way to go. <laughs> what was that? I tried to trademark it, like trademark the paintings for patients. I don't know lawyer stuff. Like I don't know the copyright laws and trademark stuff, but apparently trademarking was not the thing I should have done. So it didn't happen. And now it's just kind of this idea that I have floating out there. <laughs> well, you know, honestly, it's, it's such a brilliant thing and I'll give you, I'll pitch you a business idea on it. Yeah. Uh, I hope you owned a website. You better, oh. if not go buy it before this thing airs. Oh. Uh, <laughs> If not, I'm going to buy it and I'll sell it to you for $100,000. Um, Deal. <laughs> so, you know, with that, you can um, you can uh, uh, sell your paintings to the, to the hospitals that you are close to you, right? So, yeah, yeah. Right. But you're also doing prints, correct? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Okay. Um, there's a tool that you might want to look into. It's called okay. artstorefront.com. Art Storefront. I think I may have heard of them, but keep yeah, going. You definitely want to sign up for them. Okay? okay. They're not sponsoring my show yet, Art Storefronts, <laughs> but I really hope they do. But, um, but seriously, it, if you started a website, uh, patients, uh, paintingsforpatients.com, right? Yeah. And do it through them. Uh, you can upload your images and people can buy the prints directly from uh, off your website. But what's mm-hmm. beautiful is they have the, uh, they have relationships with high quality uh, art print uh, 
publishers, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. frame shops and all that stuff. So people can go order exactly what they want and they have it in different zones throughout the United States. So um, th that way it can get delivered quicker and, and all that stuff. So like mm -hmm. they're so committed to marketing, which I can tell you are, yeah. um, and making the artist win and mm -hmm. their tool is incredible, but the people behind it are even far more incredible. Yeah. And, and so the idea would be one of the things that you can do through them is actually start a, a gallery, right? So you can uh -huh. have other artists who would want to submit their work uh -huh. to your company. Uh -huh. So you become like a hallmark for hospitals, you know? Okay. And, um, and you can sell originals uh -huh. or, and prints from the same website and it, you do it all through the back end, and it's just so, um, it's just set up for artists to win. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. I, um, I've been thinking about with my paintings for patients cause I can see it, um, becoming something bigger than it is. I mm -hmm. just haven't figured out which direction I want to go with it. Um, but one of the things that I want to keep, um, uh, true to what I'm doing is I want, I don't want the hospitals buying work from me. Like that feels like a weird, I don't know. Like, so all the paintings I do are donation, you know, I'm doing this for the patients and then the prints that I sell, I'm selling to whoever wants to enjoy them. And That's then, beautiful. A, yeah. And then the portion of the proceeds that I get from those prints that I've sold, I give back to an organization that then supports those patients. So it's like this full cycle um, that ultimately one covers my cost of my materials, <laughs> but also mm -hmm. the, the main focus is the patients. Um, so yeah, so like what I'm doing right now through my website is I sell those prints to anybody who wants them in their homes, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But the patients are the ones getting the original artwork every time. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. And then, um, like I said, like this past year I donated to the Dr. Susan Love foundation for breast cancer research. Mm. Um, so that was really cool to be able to donate to an organization that helps, helps the patients like the ones I serve. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping to do that every year and have that grow. Um, but I could see it becoming like a nonprofit or, you know, yeah. having other people get involved and having other artists contribute their artwork in other areas. And I don't know, I feel like there are a lot of different ways it could go. Pray on it, live yeah. on it. Um, I would just not wait on it. Yeah. Because yeah. as soon as someone sees that, it's gone. It, it's go it, yeah. And and so you know, if you want to give your paintings away, that's awesome. And if you want to sell, you know, because what I like about it is, but when you put it online, then someone in Texas or England or wherever, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, oh wait, I could send this beautiful frame picture to my friend who's sick right right exactly <laughs> and yeah. and uh you know and you might even do something where you might have two galleries of artists mm -hmm. one one gallery which may be, be the spotlighted artists mm -hmm. are the ones who actually donate the original to mm -hmm. hospitals or to patients you know yeah. and then the other group of artists that that lower tier artists they're just using their their floral prints that they've already sold to a, you know in a commission or at a show or whatever but they mm -hmm. but they're using the image to now be available for for um you know for people to buy the prints of to to, to send mm -hmm. to the patients but you you'll figure it out you're 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 really smart so um <laughs> but yeah there's something brilliant there and i would love to see someone with a heart like yours run with that thing yeah yeah well i would appreciate your prayers about it too because like i said I'm, I'm a little bit torn on where where to take it at this point so it'll take some some noodling and some thinking and yeah, just, just don't, 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 don't ask me to pray for it because if i do things will happen <laughs> and, and, and so you better move very very quickly if i pray for it um <laughs> You better be ready. You wake up tomorrow and somebody knocking on your door. Hey, 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 hey. Do you know anyone who paints for hospitals? What? Um, <laughs> there was a, a, 
a year, a few years ago, um, I started, I was like, I want to document my prayer life. Right. Uh So I I started writing down like what I'd pray for Uh and, and how long it would take for it to come to pass. Mm -hmm. And that summer, almost 80% of the time that I prayed for something, it only took an hour and a half to three hours for it to come to pass. That's awesome. Yeah. I was like, okay, that's cool. Creepy, little scared. Yeah. But thank you. (laughs) Are you still documenting it? Uh, No. Um, Yeah. And like with my kids, I I used to pray over my kids, like when they go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, Because one night they were just like all acting dumb and yeah. <laughs> and i was like i don't know what to do right and so i was like okay i just start praying and so i prayed and like the atmosphere in the room shifted and they just went boom they just stopped right yeah. and um and so i that's what i would do in the evenings and like my son would have all this energy and i started recording it and it would be like 30 seconds they were asleep right it, it was like yeah. I like, just start doing that over my dogs. It works with dogs too, yeah. <laughs> um, it's weird. <laughs> I remember I was at my parents' house one day, and they they, they were being ravaged with these um, caterpillars, right? Oh, whoa! And these caterpillars, when they come into an area, they eat all the, the trees, mm-hmm. and they kill everything within four years and they were already in their third year of these caterpillars. Oh and, and so my mom and my dad moved up to this place in the mountains because of the scenery and everything. Right. But now these mm-hmm. caterpillars are there and my dad called the, the government. They couldn't do nothing about it. They called the local colleges to see if they, nobody could do anything about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, they went away. They happened to go to Hawaii and I was house sitting for them at the time and their dogs were there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was just like, man, I want to give them a gift. And so I started praying about these caterpillars, right? Mm-hmm. And the dogs walked into the room and it was the craziest thing. They just like sat there and went quiet. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and then I prayed and then like, I forgot about it. And they came back and I went to my house and then we were going to go to the cabin uh, for vacation. I came up to meet my dad and some guy came in and said, so uh, Paul, how are the caterpillars? And my dad's like, well, I I don't know. Uh, We came (laughs) back from Hawaii and like, they were all gone. (laughs) Like, right. And I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah, they just, they're just gone. There's none. There's no caterpillar. And there were, let me tell you. I was maybe 60 feet away from a tree and yeah. you could see the caterpillars crawling up and down the tree. They were so bad. Mm-hmm. When you walked outside, you could hear them eating and pooping. Like there were so many caterpillars everywhere. What did these caterpillars turn into? Uh, I don't, uh, I don't know what they turned into, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget what, what kind they were called. I think they were gypsy, gypsy. No, that's not right. They might have been gypsy caterpillars. I don't. I don't know. Hmm. But um. That's but anyways, cool. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pray with your dogs. <laughs> they respond. Duly noted. Yeah. <laughs> um. So. My favorite question for you. Hmm. What's something that you like to eat? Well, I would have to say my favorite food is ice cream. Okay. You call that a food? All right. (laughs) If it goes in my mouth and it makes me smile, it's food. Right. I mean, you got your dairy in there. Sometimes you got some fruits. Chocolate's not terrible for you if it's dark chocolate. So peanut butter is good for you. This is true. It's protein. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I get a lot out of ice cream. I don't know what people are talking about. Um, I've always loved ice cream. I've always had a sweet tooth. So that's, that's a big thing. I, I will eat it anywhere, anytime. I've had it for breakfast before. Uh, um, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. um, and, what kind of ice cream do you like? The, like what, what are some of your favorites? Um, my go-tos are usually some chocolate peanut butter combination, like moose mm. tracks or, you know, Reese's, something or other. 
And when you were when you were in Italy, did you have the gelato? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which one do you prefer, the gelato or like your your normal ice cream? Um, probably normal ice cream, mm -hmm. but the gelato was super refreshing and super delicious because it was gelato in Italy, and it just doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> so you know. <laughs> That's I'm cool. not too picky <laughs> when it comes to my ice cream. Nice, nice. And so outside of ice cream, what else do you like to eat or, or cook? Uh, I love barbecue. Okay. Um, that's always a go-to. When I was a kid and my mom, would, <clears throat> my mom would always ask, you know, what do you want for your birthday? You know, as your birthday meal, it was almost always barbecue. Ah, nice. Um, like barbecue pulled pork or something. Um, I just recently made ribs in the crock pot. What? Um, so I've always been super intimidated by making my own barbecue. Because, you know, I watch... I'll watch cooking shows and they'll, you know, be barbecuing with Barb with Bobby Flay and he'll be smoking <laughs> these massive like things of meat and they have to smoke for hours and hours and there's this dry rub that's super complex and goes into you know it just takes so yeah. much time and it's like a science all in and of itself. Um, so I've always been super intimidated and then I you know I got a crock pot and I found a you know you just Google crock pot ribs easy. <laughs> and we just come up with a million recipes and we had ribs a couple times with friends over the summer and they just you know if you cook them too long or slightly the wrong way they come out real dry and they're just not super satisfying and so we tried them this one time in the crock pot and i kid you not they fall off the bone oh god like you don't there you don't need a fork you don't need a knife it literally just falls right off the bone they are so moist and they are so flavorful and you just, you literally layer them in the crock pot with some barbecue sauce and hit go for eight All right. hours. I'm doing it Friday. Yep. I'm doing, well, actually, I'll do it Thursday night so that they're ready for Friday morning. Perfect. Yeah. And then if you want to get a little bit extra fancy, you know, mm -hmm. put in like five minutes more of work, um, you take them out when they're done, smother some more barbecue sauce on them, and then you stick them in the oven on broil for yeah. like five minutes just to kind of caramelize. Chris crisp mm -hmm. those edges and they are oh they're so good i will never ever grill ribs ever again oh that sounds beautiful oh all right <laughs> I, I i i have a crock pot and i've done some things in it i haven't done anything yet that i've been fully satisfied with yet mm -hmm. but that this little uh, recipe sounds uh absolutely incredible Oh, so, so, so I guess this weekend I'm making ribs on Friday mm -hmm. and pernil on Sunday. I, the last uh, I did an interview yesterday with a guy out of the Bronx and he's Puerto Rican and he makes pernil, which is basically roasted pig. Oh, and, nice. uh, and then you do that, you, you, you caramelize the skin on top mm -hmm. of, you know, and it's like, oh, delicious. So oh, I guess nice. this will be a, a pork filled weekend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll maybe get some ice cream in there somewhere. Right, right. <laughs> You're planning a very summery weekend of meals. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, like, I don't eat meat um, okay. except on Fridays and Sundays. Oh, okay. And um, and so uh, it's just something I did. I started about a month ago, and uh -huh. crazily, I, I've I dropped like twenty pounds doing it. So. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So um, there's a couple other little things I, I do. Like I, I don't mix um, dairy with, with meat anymore. Like, huh. So I won't get like cheese on a hamburger or that uh -huh. kind of thing. Yeah. And it's weird. Like just that one little rule for myself, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, it's so hard. Like, okay, yeah, I don't want any meat on my pizza, right? Like it, it's oh, just it's weird. Yeah. Like how many things we, we add cheese and meat too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then and then there's this other little rule um which is if i eat fruit i can't have protein until 30 minutes later or if i eat protein i can't have fruit until three hours later Whoa. and it's all about like how the speed of the way food digests in your body uh-huh yeah that makes sense yeah so if you eat meat it takes forever and then you put fruit on top of it then it just ferments inside you huh. right and you're like uh and um, and so just by 
just observing those little rules, mm -hmm. um, I end up losing 20 pounds, like no exercise or anything, like mm -hmm. just boom, you know, it's like, yeah. whoa. My sister crazy. loves stuff like that. She's a personal trainer and dietetics nutrition person. So she's always like posting different things like that, that she's learned. Hmm. So that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I will, I, I, I'm tasting the ribs for Friday already. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go out and put, I'm going to buy them tomorrow and like, just like, oh, maybe that's what I should do. I should just like marinate them for like two or three days. Right. There you go. Like, I don't even yeah. marinate them. I usually, so I'm terrible about marinating meat because I will take it out of the freezer, put it in the fridge, blah, blah, blah. And then it'll get to like four o'clock and I'll say, oh yeah, I was going to make that for dinner. I guess it's a little late to uh, marinate it for a while, but uh, <laughs> that's what we're having. So here we go. <laughs> well, if I do it tomorrow, I, that gives me like two or three days before I have to cook it. So yeah, um, that'll be perfect. That'll yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lauren, it was a pleasure uh, talking with you. Um, would you tell us where people can come find you or get in, in contact with you? Sure. Um, so my website is laurenandersonfineart.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, Instagram, I think, is laurenanderson underscore fine art, and Facebook is something similar. Um, so yeah, I'm reachable through all those things. <laughs> cool. And, I'll, and and I think you put that in that form. So I'll, I'll take that um, yeah. and add it to the show notes so that people can just click on those links and oh, jump over and connect with you. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. In just 30 days, the Core 80 experience teaches you to decode the intentional design underneath great masterpieces. Through video lessons, assignments, and feedback, you learn to recognize the underlining structures like thrust maps, echoes, and gamuts that give master compositions substance and gravitas. Knowing how master artists and illustrators compose their artwork unlocks your ability to give your artwork more meaning and energy. Enroll today and get a seven-day, no-hassle, money-back guarantee at core80.com.